All right. Let's get over here. Reading view. There we go. So purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Did y'all know that uh, even the Bible has things about purging and detoxification? Huh, did you, you didn't know that, did you? Okay, well, it's, it's like we're not getting smarter. We're getting dumber as a species. Uh, but this is Psalm 51, 7. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be cleansed. Clean, wash me and I sh shall be white, whiter than snow. Psalm 51, 8. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice and this is gonna just gonna have a, a continual theme on today in that i'm gonna open up again with uh the mms and cleansing our bodies cleansing our temples quit putting the junk in and you'll quit getting junk out we aren't getting smarter we're getting dumber hyssop oil improved nutrient absor uh, absorption and it's just another detox agent a hyssop so when he said, uh, wash me with the hyssop so I'll be whiter than snow, it was a part of the purging process. It, it was a natural element to, to purge the body. Cognitive dissonance. And let's start with this. Um, last week I forgot to put this in here. So we're going again into uh, uh, the law, what it means, the parables. Uh, we're going to speak of Yahusha in Matthew chapter 13 today. And Matthew chapter 13, 19 uh, and why the parables are so hard for people to understand and the, the reason why they don't understand them is because they won't take the time to understand them and actually put the thought in necessary to grasp the concept cognitive dissonance Isaiah 6 9 and he said go and tell this people hear you indeed but understand not and see you indeed but perceive not make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest, lest they should uh, they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Now, see, that's the Old Testament uh, prophecy of something that was fulfilled by Yahushua, Matthew thirteen fourteen, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, see, this, this goes back hand in hand with what I talk about all the time here. You can't say it. You can't mouth it. You can't, somebody else can't walk it for you. Either you're going to come to the revelation of who and what you are and who Yahusha and Yahuwah is, or it's just a waste of time. It's just window dressing for everybody else to see you. And either it, this, is, this is a serious uh, discussion here today, um, so stick with me, folks. The theory of cognitive dissonance, dissonance, a lack of agreement. You're going to notice this as we keep going forward in this walk. To, uh, for myself is to come out of Babylon is that you're gonna these words agreement contract honor dishonor all these things are gonna keep coming up uh, discord consistency harmony as computers go the human brain is without parallel or parity when compared to even the most sophisticated man-made computer <coughs> nevertheless it is a computer and like all computers it can be programmed see this this is the point of programming children Raise a child up the way they shall, they shall go, and they shall never depart from it. Well, guess who raises your child? It's the state, and guess what? They never depart from it, ever. Plain and simple. There's a theory known as the theory of cognitive dissonance, which holds that the mind involuntarily rejects information not in line with the previous thoughts or actions. And what you'll see when, when you bring new information to people, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is, I don't believe it. And that's the cognitive dissonance. It's not that it can't be believed. They just refuse to believe it. It doesn't matter if you take uh, evidence upon evidence and slam it into their face. That the doesn't matter. I don't want to believe it is what they should say. All right. In his book, A Theory of Cognitive Dissonance, Stanford University Press, Festinger says that new events or new information create an unpleasantness, a dissonance with existing knowledge, opinion, or co uh, cognition concerning behavior. When this happens, pressures naturally arise within the person to reduce the dissonance, not reconciling the new information with the old, but reducing the dissonance. And what this is, it, it, time and time again, I tell y'all over and over again, 
Truth forces you into the mirror and makes you look at yourself and go, who am I? What am I doing and why do I believe this way? So most people will just reject that route. There's nothing about me that I need to change. I can stay the same. Everything's just hunky-dory in my life. I don't have to change. Well, of course, when you do that, you're a victim of your own cognitive dissonance. And you'd rather continue believing the lie. All right. A person can deal with the pressure generated by the dissonance by changing the old behavior. And that's one of the hardest things to do, right? Just to change the old ways and, and come to a new man. To harmonize with information. But if the person is too committed to the old behavior and way of thinking, he simply rejects the new information. A simple I don't believe it thought or word is the easy cop out. For if you are unaware, you are unaware of being unaware. If you're ignorant, you don't even know you're ignorant. If you're nescient, you, you never knew. Alright, so stay with me now. Review. Each and every man and woman has the ability to seek the word and the truth, but not everyone will do it. Most will continue to rely on what is comfortable and seek the refuge of the world. Because that's the easy thing, right? We don't have to hurt anybody's feelings. We don't have to tell anybody no. We don't have to do anything that is outside the norm. We can just keep on going. That's the easy route. That's, that's, that's the easy route. That's the way of the world. What is done here in, in this study has a purpose. That purpose is to show each and every man or woman that comes here that there is zero reason to fear the knowledge of the truth, but ra rather to become empowered with that knowledge and not allow the wolves to feed on your ignorance anymore. I unfortunately cannot force anyone to take that step of faith and, put, and to put the knowledge learned into action. It's indeed... The parable of the sower. Behold, a sower went forth to sow, and when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came in and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up, because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among the thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And of course, this goes into a, a, a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A good tree don't produce bad fruit. The plant, the, the plant the seeds and the fruit will come. You have to do the work to get there. Who hath ears to hear, let them hear. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge because thou hast rejected knowledge. I will also reject thee unto the third and fourth generation. These things are important, folks. It, it, this, you know... I wish it was as easy as to sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya and clap our hands and that, that was it. But it's really not that easy. It's, it's not that easy. It, 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 it just isn't. Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. He's talking directly to the apostles there. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. Well, that kind of seems backwards, right? Uh, but, well, it's not. And I'm going to explain that. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore I speak unto them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And, uh, you know, I, I kept wondering why, why would uh, Yahushua say this. For whoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. That seems backwards, though, in our mind, right? It should be given to the, the lesser spirit, right? Well, no, because it's the one that seeks that shall get. Not the one that sits idly by. That's right. You can't sit idly by and receive. It means get up off your butt. Jeremiah twenty three twenty eight. The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith Yah? What's the chaff to the wheat? The chaff is the weed. The wheat's kept. What happens at the end of the time? The, gather, gather them all into my barn, barn. And at the end of the time, I'll burn the chaff. Okay? Separate the, where, uh, the wheat from the tares. Is not my word like a fire, saith Yah, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces? Yes, it is. And I'm going to speak about the Mandela effect quickly. 
I've had a few people. I don't even know if y'all know what the Mandela effect is. I had a few people, and I, I've always said the uh, Yah's pr- prayer with trespasses and trespasses against me. But the people are going, "Oh my goodness, they changed in the Bible. There's a supernatural thing going on where they changed the words of the Bible." Well, really, folks, there's only one Creator. There's only one outside of space, time, and material. So if it's changing, it's the living Word, and it's changed by who? <laughs> okay. Now let me ask you another question. The, the wording being changed from trespasses to debts. Let's just go ahead and just think about this for a second. What does that expose? What system does that expose? It exposes the what? The debt servitude, your slavery. Right? Because that's more in line with trespasses. You're not trespassing a piece of property. Your debt is the, what you're born into, the sin. The debt, because you didn't know your contracts. You, you, you took the agreement without understanding. So anyway, uh, I'm, that's all I'm going to touch on that Mandela effect. I, there's some things I've gone on that I misremembered or I just knew was something else. There, there is something going on there. I'm not saying it's not. But what I'm telling you is that when it comes to to just one word or two words in the, in the, in the Bible being changed because of the Mandela effect, well, for this instance right here, it was great change. I'm pretty sure if it was them changing stuff, they wouldn't have changed it to debt. All right, let's show. I'm I'm going to show you for a second here how they use parables through Hollywood, and they they use Hollywood, and people go, man, I remember seeing that in a movie 20 years ago. Now it's here. Oh, really, folks? You don't really get what's going on. That is your informed consent. Okay. Uh, last year they come out with a movie with Gerald Butler. It was a uh, geostorm blockbuster. Show them a, a, a geoengineering and controlling storms to the point where they'd end up going haywire. All right, this is another movie right here, Toxic Skies, where they're spraying the sky. Folks, wake up! Wake up! They're telling you watch the movie Matrix. I tell you another movie to watch is this new Aquaman where they merge in the law of the land and the sea together. They they join in the two worlds. Guess what? That it's already done. Hollywood uses parables themselves in the form of movies. These movies are your informed consent. Movies are always used as predictive programming for the masses. It's getting you ready for the next age. And that's all it's for. It's the wood from the holly tree. All right, the parable of the sower explained. Hear you therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, cometh the wicked one, and catcheth that away which was sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. I was that person once. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and instantly with joy receive it. I was that person once also. Okay, we're gonna see stages here, folks. Each one of us were at at stages on this process. Okay. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. What did he just say? When something he read, he didn't like. And he didn't want to change his belief. He just, I don't believe it. I'll do what I want. There's a cognitive dissonance. Okay? Understand these things. This stuff's here for a reason. And we all go through it and we all do it. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches chokes it. And he becometh unfruitful. Matthew thirteen twenty three. But he that received the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understands it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. See the 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 hearing it and the understanding it kind of go hand in hand, don't they? It's kind of important. It's kind of important to understand what you're reading. That's in all things, folks. The value of wisdom, Proverbs two one. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, 
So if that thou incline thy ear unto wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if that, that, that thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of Yah and find the knowledge of Yah. For Yah giveth wisdom, out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. And, and that's kind of important, folks, that, you know, it's it's amazing all the time that I spent uh, decoding the occult, alchemy, Kabbalah, and everything else, I have never once got to a subject that requires more of my time and consumes more hours than the subject that I'm on right now. And we're about to get into that here in just a minute. And there's a reason for that, folks, because this is the ultimate in revelations, especially not just not just biblically, but in turning ourselves loose from this Babylonian death death system, because we have made a hell with a agree, uh, 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 made agreement with uh, hell, and uh, we're in contract with it, folks. Okay, we're in contract with it. We're going to talk about this stuff. America, the land of the free, indentured servants in Europe were frequently offered the option to go to a mass of land known as America and work off their assumed debt. And you'll, you'll remember this, folks. All the people that come here were what? Criminals. Right? No, they weren't really criminals. They were what? Debtors is what they were. And work off their assumed debt to those they owed money and sometimes their life. Many took the gamble and found that they were able to pay off the debts much easier and faster in the land of opportunity. And they could have they could stay here, but uh, they could pay it off faster. United States, the corporation. Now here's where we're going to get into today a little bit deeper, is this corporation. Uh, folks, you don't have a government. You do not. You have a corporation. And a corp that corporation is the District of Columbia. That district District of Columbia is 10 miles squared in Washington, D.C. It is a foreign corporation. And that's a fact. There's nothing anyone in this country or anywhere one else in this world can deny that. You don't have a repre uh, representing government. All right. 1871, the United States incorporated in England, as was sta stated earlier, and therefore became an English corporation under the rule of the crown, Rothschild. As you will see, corporations are not governments. They can't be. They can only rule by contracts through corpor uh, corporate copyrighted policy. How can a corporation have authority over you? Only by and within the framework and four corners doctrine of contract law. How many of you have heard of the four corners of the doctrine? contract law. Anybody? Before this week, I'd never heard of it. I've done some research. We're going to look into this code right here. I'm, I'm going I'm to leave these terms here, and I'm going to share in the show notes, Black's Law Dictionary, 4th edition. Uh, these words and phrases right here, corporation, law, legal, lie, color of law, rights, benefits, cert certificate, application, attorney, represent, organization, organ, work, policy, copyright, private. I would advise each and every person out there to define these terms just like it says right here. Uh, one in the standard dictionary and two in the law dictionary. And once you do so, what you're going to do is notice that there's two different definitions for every single one of these words up here. Well, folks, if a word has multiple meanings, what does it mean? Absolutely nothing. Okay? And that's pretty important. That's pretty important. Here we go. This is Cornell Law School. This is uh, U.S. Code, Title 28, Judiciary and Judicial Procedure. I've shown you all this before, but it's hard to understand it, right? The United States means a federal corporation. You do not have a government. Period. I don't care what puppet they put up there or what game they play. It is the, the constant theater of Thanatos. See, they have to keep the theater going. That way, that way people be still believe it to be so. That is the purpose of it all. When really they're at war. 
and they show you this day in and day out every through the vaccines, the medical, uh, the drugs on the streets. There's a war on the people, folks. Instrumentality of the United States. Property is kind of big right here. Held in trust by the United States for the benefit of an Indian tribe or individual Indian, a sovereign. It's held in trust. Y'all just remember that as we move forward. There's a key to this trust that we're going to uncover as we go forward. Because there's something that happens when you step outside of this, this entity. We'll get to that point. We're going we're gonna to keep taking baby steps right now. All right? And here, um, we're going to take baby steps because we've got to get to the point where we're ready to understand this information. A corporation, this is straight out of the Black's Law Dictionary. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and show you all this. Because I'm such a weirdo. And uh, this is what I do on my time off. Let's go ahead and zoom in a little bit. When I'm not doing anything, I read dictionaries. I'm just going to show you real quick. Persons are two kinds, natural and artificial. What? Huh? We're going to read all this in a little while, but just understand this, that when we start reading these definitions and defining the terms, just like we've done with the occult, just like we've done in opening up the Bibles and defining the words in, this is going to blow your socks off if you want to know it. And then once if you want to know it, then you can release yourself from it. All right, let's get back to the, the study. We'll, we'll look at that again later. Corporation, an artificial person or legal entity created by or under the authority of the laws of a state or nation. And you'll know this ambiguity where it's vague. It's vague, right? In some rare instances of a single person and his successors being the incumbents of a particular office, but ordinarily consisting of an association of numerous individuals. Well, hold on, folks. The law of contradiction tells me it either, it, it either is or isn't to be truth or lie. You can't have one or the other. It can't be an artificial person and a natural person. It just can't be. And this, of course, gets back, back into why people go to study, study language to become lawyers and attorneys is to keep the fraud going. All right? Irrespective of changes in its membership, either in perpetuity or for a limited term of years, and of acting as a unit or single individual in matters relating to the common purpose of the association, within the scope of the powers and authorities conferred upon such bodies by law. Okay, so let's read the next definition. Let's see what they got to say right here, okay? A corporation is more nearly a method than a thing. What? It's a method of what? What did they just say there? It's a method, not a thing. And the law, in dealing with a corporation, need not define it as a person or entity, or even as an embodiment and functions, rights and duties. Farmers Loan and Trust Company versus Pearson. The statement that a corporation is an artificial person or entity apart from its members is merely a description in figurative language of a corporation viewed as a collective body. Are you understanding yet? The corporation isn't real. It's a fiction of the law. We've gone through this. We're going to keep on hammering through it until people really grasp the concept. Oh, here's a nice one right here. We're going to go to the state first, the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan right here. All right. A corporation is a collection of natural persons joined together by their voluntary action, voluntary, voluntary, you're going to keep seeing this over and over again, or by legal compulsion, by or under the authority of an act of legislature, consisting either of a special charter or a general permissive statute to accomplish some purpose. And there it is. We're going to keep rolling now. That's, this, this is just all. It, it, at the end of the day, the color of the law. What's the color of the you, you hear people talking about the color of the law all the time. It's the color of the law. Uh, the appearance or semblance. That's that semblance. That's that raising the dead again without the substance of, of legal right. So you have to come to this concept first, man. And once you come to this concept uh, of understanding this, what I'm about to say right here, a crime cannot be committed without there being a what? Boom. 
Very good. A crime cannot be committed without a victim. Impossible. Okay? So who's committing the real crimes when, let, let's just give a, uh, an allegory. If I get, I'm doing my, mine in my own business, I haven't hurt anybody. I get pulled over because the tail lights out. I get accosted by a cop. Who's, who's really committed, committed the crime? He has. Why? He imposed his will on me without me asking him to. And by threat of what will I comply? Force. That's called extortion and blackmail. And see, these concepts you got to start to understand. Because I didn't do anything wrong. My tail light just went out. I didn't commit a crime. That's a statute, code, or a regulation. Put in by some other man sitting in his ivory tower stating that I must comply with that. You never entered into a contract with that. You never agreed to that. It, th these concepts are important as we move forward because once you start understanding the small things, we can get to the bigger things. Color of law does not apply when, when you accept the contract. 18 U.S. Code 242, deprivation of rights under color of law. They already know they're committing crimes under the color of the law. And it goes back to this, though. Who does it? They make, they make the rules up top. Who actually, who actually sins against his fellow man? Us. We do. We're the ones who commit the crimes. They don't do anything. It's us. It's the military man. It's the Marines. It's the Army. It's, it's all the low grunts that commit the crimes. It's not them. And this is important. Whoever, under color of law, statute, ordinance, regulation, or custom, willfully subjects any person in any state territory, commonwealth, possession, or district to the deprivation of any rights, privileges, or immunities secured or protected by the Constitution or laws of the United States or to different punishments, pains, or penalties on account of such person being an alien. And, of course, we'll get into that, too. We're going to discuss what an alien really means. It's an alien. Color of law does not apply when you accept the contract. Contract. And this is where things start getting inter interesting. Remember the IRS stuff that I got into and they sent me the letters and they asked me, uh, hey, if you do not agree, write back to us or call us. At that point in time, I was supposed to write back to them. I, I didn't have the knowledge to do that at that point in time. I was supposed to write them, but I called them. The point is, though, listen, that is the assumption. If you accept that contract, you are now what? Obliged to pay it. You obligated. You accepted the four corners of that contract. What's the four corner doctrine, folks? Huh? That's what's in the document. That's what's in the document, right? It's the four corners of a page. That's why anything on the outside of the margin is what? Null and void. That's why you're not supposed to read uh, Bible commentaries. Why? Because it's void. It's not part of the four corners of doctrine. It's what separates the written word of the Bible away from everybody else. Because you have your law. And it's written down. A promissory agreement between two or more persons that creates, modifies, or destroys a legal rela uh, relation. All right? An agreement between two or more parties. Two or more. Have to be in agreement. Now, there's ways to go about getting this agreement. One's by fraud. One's by an actual agreement. Me and Johnny decide to do something. I shake his hand, look him in the eye. That's a contract. Okay? And acceptance by other, in which minds of parties meet and concur in understanding of terms. All right? It is an agreement. Here, this is the most important part. I want y'all to read, read this right here. Oh, what happened? What did I do? It is an agreement creating what? Obligation. I know you can't see that. It binds you. Once you agree. 
You are now bound. Oh, they they make you think that anyway. A contract or agreement is whether uh, either where a promise is made on one side and assented to on the other, or where no, two or more persons enter into engagement with e each other by a promise on either side. That's where the fraud starts. So when they they ask you, they send you the statement. Is a statement the same thing as a bill, folks? No. No, it's just a statement. Why do you only get statements? Because we're not in a legal government. That's why you only get a statement. You'll never get a bill. You get a statement. When you get the statement, you go, oh my goodness, same thing I've done. Oh, oh this is a whole um. And because you're so ignorant, you don't realize what you're about to do. You're about to make a contract with somebody, and once you do, then you become obligated. Laws of contracts, an agreement, convention, or promise of two or more parties by deed, in writing, signed, sealed, and delivered. Why doesn't the IRS contact you any other way than uh, by mail? Because they are bound by their system. That's why. And once you start reading their system and coming to an understanding of their system, well... Now who has the upper hand? Can I be defrauded? I'm going to make sure I'm not anymore. By which either of the parties pledges himself. So a pledge is saying, okay, I agree to it. Well, well, hold on, folks. If you really owed the IRS that money, would they be able to negotiate with you lower values? No, because you don't owe them nothing. It's, it, it, that's the key, right? Because the trust is already built in your name. That's the Social Security number. What if they're double dipping? I did that one time. Huh? <laughs> I did that one time. Double with my Social Security and uh, with an employment. And I didn't realize I was even doing that. Yeah, well, what if they're double dipping? What if they're already paid via your trust that's in your name and then sending you a statement and you're agreeing to pay again? This is something to think of, think of as we move forward. Express or implied contract, okay? The former being those which are created by the express words of the parties to the deed declaratory of their intention. Okay, The express is actually, hey, we're going to work out the details of this contract. You're fully, you're fully understanding what these details are. Okay, That's express. While implied covenants are those which are inferred by the law from certain words in a deed which imply, though they do not express them. Fraud. Express covenants are also co called covenants in deed. Hey folks, I'm telling you, I'm telling you start paying attention to this and very, very important word of in deed. Okay? as distinguished from covenants in law. That's McDonough versus Martin. Implied means you don't have you don't have informed consent. Contracts. Failure to understand the above and realize what law you're dealing with when you go into their court will only lead to failure. So <laughs> if you don't understand the language that you're up against, how are you going to beat it? You're not. I'm going to start reading here. So, so uh, even if you have filed your UCC-1 and have captured your title and your artificial entity, this makes no difference in their courts. Why? They operate in total fiction in the land of Oz. We already, we've already we proven that time and time again. They can't deal with the living man or woman because that's not a fiction of the law. In respect to any assumed standing, which you may by mistake they think, think otherwise, they can only recognize contracts. You are a real sentient being outside of their created social compact. 
their perceived law, which is copyrighted in the administrative or judicial power of their original jurisdiction inside of their established so, uh, social compacts or otherwise, is all that is real, lawful, incredibly in truth to them. They do not recognize truth of any sort. Matter of fact, they can interpret and mis, uh, misconstrue and, and change and adapt the laws as they de uh, deem or uh, deem fit. Right there in the courtroom. They can do that. And they do it time and time again. They do it time and time again. If it, if, if it was the other way, if things were done because they were just, right? If that's what we were based on, we wouldn't be killing babies. We wouldn't be having uh, transgender sex change operations on children in school. We wouldn't be doing forced vaccinations like they're doing in New York, stealing the children from the mothers. This is the reality. Okay? This is the reality. All right. So when you go into any court, be aware that there, that it is their private copyrighted law that the judge of the prosecutor can construe or construct that law in any fashion they chose to choose. That's why they, they say the, the Constitution is open to what? Interpretation. Interpretation. <laughs> Whatever they want it to be is what it's going to be. So does your rights come from that piece of paper? They cannot. Why? A piece of paper is only as good. It's only as good as the paper it's written on. It's no good. You're a living, sentient man or woman. Okay. So, are there courts bound by the Constitution, laws, statutes? No. They've proved that time and time again. They'll do whatever they want. No, their courts are bound by contracts only. And the statutes used to enforce the contracts. When we use their statutes, constitution, UCC, rules and regulations, all copyrighted without a license from the bar, we are in violation of copyright infringement and punishment is mandatory. Of course, that's why they kill us by air, land, and sea. Listen, folks, there's an enemy of the state. That enemy of the state is the what? The living, breathing men and women. He's already so, go ahead. I'll let you finish that thought. He can go ahead and, and finish on himself, right? What a lawyer? Yeah. He's already. He's already. We're gonna get. I'm gonna answer that question in a few slides. They they the a, a licensed attorney and a licensed are already turned. That were their pledge is not to us, and I'm gonna show you that. <coughs> their pledge is to what? To defend what? The court. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. They're officers of the court. When you step into a courtroom, what are you? Oh, uh, well, you're, you, you are the ward of the court. Well, we're going to define these terms today, what it means. So when you go get an attorney, you go get a licensed attorney, what you've really done is submit yourself to their jurisdiction. We're going to get to this stuff. We're working our way that way, folks. Because this is the most important part about this process is getting the fundamental basics to where we can understand bigger stuff. All right, there is no law in this illusionary nation state. That's kind of funny. Remember that I, we started this journey with my video, The Great Illusion. I didn't even know that book existed. Under whatever form or name for which is such is known or the world for that matter, there is only contract law by which the private people, sovereigns, Treat uh, with one another in the so-called global public forum where commerce is concerned and is the order of the day, known as the international public order via private international law between sovereigns and or their created social compacts and corporate constructs. All right, so now we're to the four corners uh, uh, rule. And this is what everything's based off of. Everything you need to know, and of course this isn't everything. I just put this up here for the, its simplicity. The Four Corners Rule stipulates that if two parties enter into a written agreement, they cannot use what? Oral or implied agreements to contradict the terms. So, the IRS sends me a letter. They say, hey, Brandon, you owe such and such. I open the letter, which is what? Breaking the seal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what should I have done? Send it back. Send it back. I should never have broken the seal. We're going to get to this. There's so much more that I'm learning today. 
about this, and I've got a long ways to go. Don't don't mis misconstrue what I'm saying. This isn't easy. This is probably the hardest subject I've ever looked into in my life. It, well, it is because it it's so it, the task is so daunting. I've spent 20 hours this week reading dictionaries and reading law books, and I I barely had a study for y'all this week. It's just it's just that massive. Trying to tie it all in is where the problem comes. Okay. The Four Corners Rule Contract Law, also known as the Patrol Evidence Rule, stipulates that if two parties enter, enter, enter into a written agreement, they cannot use oral or implied agreements in court to contradict the terms of the written agreement. So let me, let, let, let's, go, let's go back even further. So I was entered into a contract with this corporate entity when my mama and daddy did it. I passed the age of adulthood and maturity. And I didn't deny it, did I? No. It's fraud, folks. It's fraud. The term four corners refers to the four corners of a document. Basically, it implies that the only legal parts of the contract are within the what? Four corners of a page or online document. And that's, of course, why uh, legal documents, they have the boxes, okay? Each box represents a what? Four corners. Okay? Each section in there is why they're numbered 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, 1E. And that's actually how they're supposed to be read in that chronological order. Types of evidence not valid in court due to the four corners rule include conversations about the signing of the contract, written evidence that is not part of the original contract. And it just goes on. Because of the four corners rule, it is vital to include all promise and expectations of you have uh, of the other party in the original written contract. Well, whoa, put the brakes on right there, folks. If we've never been taught contract law, how can we actually know what contract law means? You can't. You can't. It's impossible. Only but what we know already to sign the contract. That's it. That's it. That's all we know. But since our whole system is built on this this fraud, what should be the right thing that we do for our children as they step into the education system? The first thing that we should teach them how to do is work. Read, right. law, write, understand what they're reading and be able to what? Sign contracts. It's our whole our, our whole yeah. uh system's built on contract law. Yeah. Wouldn't it what wouldn't, wouldn't that prepare them for life? Well that'd be too much like right, folks. Too much like what? Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lex scripta. Okay, we're gonna talk about this a little bit. Lex scripta is the Latin expression that means written or statutory law. It is in contrast to Lex non scripta, which is the non written law, customary or common law. The term ori originates from the Roman legal tradition. Now, one thing you'll find, uh, well, I'm finding even more, I've showed y'all time and time again that we speak what? Debased Latin. Well, you get into the law book and it's unbelievable how much Latin's in there. Emperor Justinian divides the Lex scripta into several categories statutes the plebiscites, the senatorial decrees, the decisions of the emperors, the orders of the magistrates, and the answers of the juris consultus. That's what Lex Scripta means. What's a clients mean? C-L-I-E-N-S without the T. Clients, Latin. In the Roman law, this is straight out of that book of the Black's Law Dictionary, a client or dependent, one who depended upon another as his patron, protector, advisor, or defender, in suits at law and other difficulties. All right. Whoa. Let's go see what client says. A person who em employs or retains an attorney. Or counselor to appear for him. Remember that word appear. Apparitions appear, okay? He's standing in the place of. In courts, advise, assist, defend him in legal persist, uh, proceedings. Here comes that next word right here. And to act for him in any legal business. It should include one who disclosed confidential matters to attorney while seeking professional aid. 
whether attorney was employed or not. Here we go. The ward of the court. This is out the same book. Infants and persons of what type of mind? Unsound. So you aren't an adult. You're a child. And because you're a child, you have to have a what? Well, you have to, you're a dependent. So you rely on somebody else to take care of you. And that's why you're a client of an attorney. Their rights must be guarded jealously. What's a plebiscite? We just saw that again, right? In modern constitutional law, the name plebiscite has been given to the vote of the entire people. That is, the aggregate of the enfranchised individuals composing a state or nation expressing their choice for or against a proposed law or enactment submitted to them in which, if adopted, will work a radical change in the Constitution or which is beyond the powers of the regular legislative body. Now, you ask 99.9% .9 of Americans today, how do they love their republic? And they go, they'll be out there popping for, uh, fireworks on July 4th, talking about, woohoo, this is the land of the free and the brave. And all they really are is what? Plebiscites. And what's the two, the class of the plebiscite? Ain't nothing changed from Rome, folks. It's them versus us. And now the only thing that's changed is via their indoctrination devices, us don't even know who we are. And that's the truth. At least back then, we'd storm the castle every now and then and let them know we've had enough. Now everybody keeps sitting around. They watch way too many hero movies. They sitting around. People watching way too much TV because they're waiting on somebody else to save them all the time instead of doing some work. But that's the main thing they show is hero movies. That's right, you know? and that's what makes people yeah, sit back and do nothing. Make off of those movies. That's the main thing you see. All right. To to what or whom is an attorney's first duty? Let's figure this out. I'm answering your question. I'm glad you asked them. We consult the latest corpus jurum. That's the dead body, right? Uh, number four, attorney and client, his first duty is to the what? The courts. And the public, not to the what? Client. Clients. The people of unsound mind. Why is it to... Well, what? Unsound mind. That's right. That's right. Well, courts, okay. His office of the court. He works for the court. Mm -hmm. The public is what? The public's an abstract thought out of many what? One, the public. E pluribus unum. So the only individual there is you. And his, his allegiance is not to you. It's actually against you. Okay? The only way it works for you is what? And wherever the duties to his client conflict with those he owes as an officer of the court... In the administration of justice, the former must yield to the latter. All the time. The court comes before the client. Okay? Because you are a ward of the court. He's an officer of the court. You're a ward. Well, a ward's a, you're a baby. Okay? The office of attorney is indispensable to the administration of justice and is intimate and peculiar in its relation to and vital to the well-being of the court. An attorney has a duty to aid the court in seeing that actions and proceedings in which he is engaged as counsel are conducted in a dignified and orderly manner, free from passion and personal animosities. What is the legal relationship between an attorney and his her client? And the term is synonymous with attorney. And what we know from that, they've a turn. They're licensed, they've turned away from, and they know it. Well, some of them do. So, we're probably so far down the rabbit hole. You know, what's sad today is that doctors are so indoctrinated now after going through eight years of college and, and them telling uh, them getting told that ripping somebody's intestines out is good for them, they actually believe it. You can get so ignorant and, and yet think you're educated. Therefore, anyone advertising himself as a lawyer holds himself out to be an attorney, an attorney at law or counselor at law. And it goes on here. Uh, I'm not going to read all of it, but a lot of good information. Uh, we'll read this. Nature of the right to practice. Uh, while it has been broadly stated that the right to practice law is not, not a natural or constitutional right, but is, is in the nature of a privilege or franchise, the practice of law is not a matter of grace, 
but of right for one who is qualified by his learning and what? Moral character. So to be ignorant of the law is to what? Just be ignorant. That's how they look at you. I've told you time and time again, I've told you here for two years now, that the way they feel, if you don't care enough about yourself, you should what? You should be dead. You and your posterity. Shall be dead. Cold. Huh. What is the ward of the court? Awards of the court, infants and persons of unsound mind placed by the court under the care of a guardian. You know, it's just something about me, myself. I guess it's that alpha male in, that's inside me. I don't want to be ruled by anybody. I will not accept it. I just will not accept it. And of course, to conclude, when you hire an attorney, you become a ward of the court and a second class citizen, and you admit all you do when you get an attorney is say, hey, I don't know anything about what I'm doing. I'm giving y'all jurisdiction. And what's jurisdiction? Or origination. That's what it is. You're giving them them the rule over you. So when you do that, all you've done is set yourself up. It's, of course, why it's called pleading. What's a plea? Please, 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 please. It's begging. <laughs> if you want to challenge jurisdiction, the only way you can do it is, is sue jurious and or in propia persona. Flesh and blood. Can't do it with somebody representing you. They can only act as you. They are not you. And you have to want it. It's just like to understand why did I go this route with the parables? Because if you don't seek to understand the words written in the Bible, you will never get this reality. And if you don't seek to understand the deeper meaning within this book, you're going to miss out on some things. And I don't want anybody to miss out on anything. Uh, let's go to uh, Black's Law Dis Dictionary and read this while we got a second. I want, I want y'all to see how crazy this is. Persons are of two kinds, natural and artificial. A natural person is a human being. They never use man or woman. Artificial per persons include a collection of succession of natural persons forming a co corporation. All right. A county is a person in a legal sense. In the, in the, here's the most important part, folks. We've gone through two bankruptcies in this in this nation. Has the bankruptcy ever stopped? No. So for bankrupt, what's going on? There's rules for bankruptcy. That's the key. It's a little key. In the United States Bankruptcy Act of 1898, it is provided that the words per persons shall include corporations. Persons are, of, uh, are subject of rights and duties, and as a subject of a right, the person is the object of the correlative duty. And conversely, the subject of a right has been called by Professor Holland the person of inheritance, the subject of a duty, the person of incidence. A person is such not because he is human, but because rights and duties are ascribed to him. The person is the, let's go up here, legal subject or substance of which the rights and duties are attributes. Hey, has anybody heard anything yet about living man or woman? Anybody? No, but you can read all this right here. I mean, it's it, it starts right here. It may include uh, partnerships, uh, a statutory requirement of such conditions. I don't mean, it just goes examples of the estate of a bankrupt or deceased person. It has been held that when the, per, uh, the word person is used in the legislative act, natural persons will be intended unless something appear in the context so that it, that it applies to artificial persons. Hey, folks, the law of contradiction applies every single place you go. You can't have one without the other. Either you're alive or you're dead. One or two. You can't be artificial, natural. You can't be a person and a man. You can only be one and the other. And we're gonna we're gonna tear this thing apart using the law of contradiction. I'm, I'm gonna tell you that right now. We're gonna we're gonna tear it apart because this this stuff is garbage. What I'm reading here. All right. Take the time to define the words tonight. I'm gonna print that little page up. 
with all those definitions. And I, 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 and I advise each and every, every uh, man or woman out there, take the time. Open up your standard dif, uh, dictionary. I'm, I'm going to put the uh, Black's Law Dictionary 4th Edition in the show notes. Um, take the time and start looking at what the real definition is of these words and these phrases and these Latin terms. Stockholm Syndrome is rampant throughout this world. And that's because the people actually love their oppressors. And it's uh, it's strange to me now that I'm so far into this, but I, I can understand it because I used to too, I guess. Uh, but we love the people that, that oppress us. That is when the people actually love their oppressors. Smaller study today, but we will close with a very powerful statement by Yahushua. The cold hard truth, Matthew nineteen twenty eight, And Yahushua said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that you which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones. He's talking to the apostles, right? The twelve the twelve the twelve apostles are going to sit on the throne and judge. Alright? Judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Matthew nineteen twenty nine. Pay pay attention, folks. And everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, shall receive what? Hundredfold, and shall inherit everlasting life. And I'm going to tell you all this too. Go read the parable that starts Matthew 20, and finish that entire chapter. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Does it sound like Yahushua thought it would be easy? It wasn't going to be easy. All right. Uh, let your word not return unto the void, but let it accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing where you sent it. And they going crazy back there now.